Another example of praise of the first commandment is the Ram in praise of Amitabha Buddha. Amitabha's body is the color of gold. The splendor of his whole marks has no peer. The light of his brow shines around a hundred worlds. White as the seas are his eyes, pure and clear, shining in his brilliance by transformation. A countless bodhisattvas and infinite Buddhas, his forty-eight vows will be our liberation. In nine lotus statues, we reach the other shore. Amitabha's body is the color of gold. Amitabha Buddha, who created the land of ultimate bliss, has a golden body. The splendor of his whole marks has no peer. The light shining from thirty-two marks and eighty subtle characteristics illumines the universe and is everywhere without equal. The light of his brow shines throughout a hundred worlds. See how vast is the fragrant light which radiates from the white hair tuft between Amitabha Buddha's eyebrows. And how big are Amitabha Buddha's eyes? White as the sea are his eyes, pure and clear. His purple-colored eyes are clear and as large as the once great oceans, shining in his brilliance by transformation. Our countless bodhisattvas and infinite Buddhas, Amitabha Buddha makes immeasurable and boundless numbers of Buddhas and bodhisattvas appear in his light. He does not just manifest Buddhas, but he also manifests bodhisattvas. Not only that, he further manifests sound hearers and those enlightened conditions. Nor does he only manifest sound hearers and those enlightened to conditions, but he also manifests immeasurable and boundless numbers of beings in the six paths of rebirth. His forty-eight vows will be our liberation. Amitabha Buddha made forty-eight great vows to rescue living beings. In nine lotus statues, we reach the other shore. The lotus flowers of Amitabha's lands are divided into nine grades, each one of which is again divided into nine grades for a total of eighty-one grades. These eighty-one grades enable everyone to reach it to the other shore of enlightenment and be reborn in the land of ultimate bliss. Now I have explained one aspect of praising the first commandment. Universal worthy Buddhist's second vow is to cultivate the merit and virtue of praising the first commandment. The Vara Diamond Sutra says, "The first commandment does not come from anywhere and does not go anywhere. Therefore, he is called the first commandment. Thus, is stillness and calm is movement. First commandment can also be explained as." Like a one who has come, yet his basic nature has not moved. This is the come one. Come refers to the fact that there is no place from which he comes, and go refers to the fact that there is no place to which he goes. Thus is the nominal principle, and come is phenomenal specifics, an expression of the unobstructed state. Of the interpenetration of nominal and phenomenal found in this sutra, this sutra discusses the drama realm of nominal and of phenomena, of the unobstructed state of interpenetration of nominal and phenomena, and the drama realm of the unobstructed state of the interpenetration of phenomena and phenomena. The first come one is just the drama realm of the unobstructed state of the interpenetration of phenomena and phenomena. First come one is also one of the ten names of the Buddha. This is also an aspect of praising the first come one. The third vow of universal worthy Buddhisattva is to extensively cultivate making offerings. Extensively means on a vast scale, and cultivate means to improve and develop. That is, one develops the ability and improves the.
quality of making offerings without the meat. There are many kinds of offerings. One might give his body as an offering. Another might give his mind. Still another could give both his body and mind as an offering. What does giving one's body as an offering mean? There are two kinds of disciples who give their bodies as offerings to all Buddhas. The first live the whole life and use their bodies to do the Buddha's work to cultivate the Buddha drama. The second are like people who are not able to live the whole life but who take out take time out of their busy schedules to come to the monastery, light incense and bow to the Buddha. This is giving the body as an offering. If you are busy or for some other reason cannot go to the temple, then you may daily with a pure and clean mind, light incense and contemplate the Buddha in your home. Perhaps you are in a remote place or in some other unusual circumstance, in which case you can still give your mind and body or body as an offering. By offering, by giving offerings of incense and flowers, or by lighting lamps before the Buddha, or by buying fruit or new clothing as an offering, or by offering lighted candles to the Buddha. One can also give his mind as an offering by cultivating the Buddha Dharma with a true mind, daily bowing to the Buddhas, worshipping and reciting sutras, always being mindful and always doing wholesome things for the sake of the Buddha Dharma. These are doing various kinds of offerings. Originally, there were 10 different kinds of offerings, but in time, the 10 became 100, and the 100 has finally become 10,000. When we make offerings to one Buddha, we contemplate ourselves making offerings to uncountable and limited numbers of Buddhas everywhere throughout the Dharma realm and in this way we make offerings before each one of these Buddhas. If you contemplate in this manner, you are doing what is called making offerings throughout the Dharma realm. By making offerings throughout the Dharma realm, you accumulate, accumulate the merit and virtue of the Dharma realm and obtain the wisdom of the Dharma realm. By obtaining this wisdom, you totally perfect the resultant position of the Dharma realm. Therefore, you should extensively cultivate making offerings. Extensively cultivate making offerings means exhausting your strength to make offerings using what the strength you have to make offerings to the Triple Jewel, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Universal worthy Bodhisattva extensively cultivates the practice of making offerings as his third vow. The Bodhisattva's fourth vow is to repent of karmic obstacles and reform. Repent means to regret previous offenses, to be contrite and self reproachful. To reform means to correct oneself so that the same offense is not committed again. To repent means that one wishes to change one's previous offenses and to so have reformed means that one does not again make such mistakes. This means that evil acts that have already been done will not be done again and that the potential for evil acts that have not yet been done is totally eradicated. It also means to cut off the continual and continuing effect of evil acts which have already been done. So reform means to increase one's good deeds and to do the good deeds which have not been done. You can also say it means to continuously do the kinds of good deeds that one has already done and to cause the kinds of good deeds that have not yet been done to be done and continuously increase. There are many kinds of comic obstacles and comic obstacles are one of the three fundamental kinds of obstacles which are comic obstacles, retribution obstacles and the obstacles stemming from afflictions. Now we are discussing how to repent of comic obstacles and reform. To repent of one's comic obstacles and reform involves repenting of one's retribution obstacles and reforming the obstacles that come from afflictions. 
in general, there are three kinds of comic obstacles which are simply the commas of body, mouth, and mind. The body creates three kinds of comma, killing comma, stealing comma, and the comma of sexual misconduct. When you discuss killing in terms of its broader aspects, it refers to killing larger animals, but in terms of its subtler aspects, killing refers to the killing of even the smallest creatures, like ants, mosquitoes, and flies. This broadly describes killing in its grosser and subtler forms, but there are also thoughts of killing. Often one does not actually kill. Having the thought to kill is an offense in the realm of one's self-nature. So have the thought to kill breaks the Bodhisattva precepts. The cause of killing, the conditions of killing, the drama of killing, and the karma of killing all break the precept against killing. When we discuss stealing in its broadest sense, it means to steal a person's country. On a smaller scale, it refers to stealing a person's livelihood. And on a fine scale, it involves pilfering nothing more than a needle, a thread, a silver of wood, or a blade of grass. In general, if you obtain something which is not given to you, you are stealing. Sexual misconduct also has its grosser and finer aspects. Even the thought of sexual desire in your mind causes your self nature to be impure and breaks the Bodhisattva precepts. The previous discussion is a general description of the karmic obstacles of the body killing, stealing, and sexual misconduct. There are also the three karmic obstacles created by the mind. The evil acts of greed, hatred, and stupidity. Karma is created from thoughts of greed. Karma is created from thoughts of hatred, and karma is created from thoughts of stupidity. Finally, there are four evil acts of the mouth. The mouth creates karmic obstacles by irreversible speech, full speech, harsh speech, and duplicity. There are many ways in which one may create offenses, karma, and so now we should resolve to repent because we do not want to allow new mistakes to arise. This is the meaning of repenting of karmic obstacles and reforming. How does one repent? Before the Buddha, one may feel deep sorrow, a pain for past mistakes so deep that one cries before the Buddha in a sincere wish to repent and reform. If you honestly repent, your karmic obstacles will be spontaneously destroyed. This describes the fourth of universal worthies fast vows. So repent of karmic obstacles and reform. The fifth of his vows is to follow along with and rejoice in merit and virtue. To follow along with means to accord with and to comply. To rejoice means to be happy. Merit is what one establishes by benefiting others, and virtue is the result of the wholesome good deeds one does. One both accords with and rejoices in one's own merit and virtue, and one also accords with and rejoices in one's own merit and virtue. And one also accords with and rejoices in the merit and virtue done by others. If you wish to repent of karmic obstacles and reform, then you must follow along and rejoice in merit and virtue by doing many kinds of meritorious and virtuous acts. In fact, doing meritorious and virtuous. Virtuous acts is just repenting of one's karmic obstacles and reforming. Therefore, it is said, to follow and rejoice in merit and virtue is to repent of karmic obstacles and reform. And to repent of karmic obstacles and reform is to follow and rejoice in merit and virtue. If this is the case, then are not the fourth and fifth vows redundant? If they are, then why? Do we have this fifth vow? The fourth vow instructs us to repent of karmic obstacles and reform. And if one wishes to repent of karmic obstacles and reform, one should also fulfill the fifth vow 
and follow and rejoice in merit and virtue. But in fact, there are two separate and distinct things that one must do to practice these vows. To follow and rejoice in merit and virtue includes doing all kinds of good deeds and not crimes or evil acts. To follow and re in rejoice in merit and virtue, one may do something which benefits others and this action is called a good deed. Merit is established by doing things for everyone, by acting for the general good. For example, the Chinese character which means merit kung is made up of the characteristics which means work kung and the character which means strength li. You should use your strength when doing acts of merit and virtue and be sure that you are working for everyone, for the general good and not for your own selfish interest. At present, the government has kept most public work projects, but in earlier times, government were not involved in projects like fixing bridges, and so those who did this work established merit. This is an example of how to establish merit. Whatever you do that is the general good is called merit. Meritorious acts are readily apparent to everyone. They have obvious characteristics and everyone knows who did a meritorious deed. For example, schools have people's names carved into blocks to show who helped make the building possible. This describes establishing merit. By practicing what is good, one improves oneself. This is virtual. Whatever good you do that delights your mind is called virtual. Most people will not necessarily know that a person's virtuous acts, but establishing merit is something everyone knows about. There are two kinds of virtue, apparent and hidden. Apparent virtue is known by all and causes everyone to be happy, and hidden virtue is done to benefit everyone, but already is anyone aware of it. For example, spiritual powers can help all living beings in an invisible way, but no one is aware of them. This is an example of hidden virtue. When one follows and rejoices in merit and virtue, one should reveal one's good deeds and causes others to do similar acts so that they too can follow and rejoice in merit and virtue of others. Not only does this vow involve following and rejoicing in the merit and virtue of oneself and others, but it also includes following and rejoicing in the merit and virtue of all good deeds that bring joy to all living beings of the Dharma realm. You follow them and rejoice by helping them to do their joyful and wholesome acts. You can also follow and rejoice in the merit and virtue of Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, the sound hearers, and of those enlightened to conditions, as well as the merit and virtue created by all living beings. What does it mean to follow and rejoice in the merit and virtue of the Buddhas, to explain sutras and speak Dharma and to teach and transform living beings is to follow and rejoice in the merit and virtue of the Buddhas. If you teach people to practice the six perfections and the 10,000 practices and to cultivate the Bodhisattva way, then you are following and rejoicing in the merit and virtue of Bodhisattvas when you teach people to cultivate the twelve links of causes and conditions, then you follow and rejoice in the merit and virtue of those enlightened to conditions to cause others to become aware of the four noble truths, is to follow and rejoice in the merit and virtue of the sound hearers, to follow and rejoice in the merit and virtue of gods and humans, you must teach the practices of the five precepts and the ten awesome acts. This has been a general explanation of universal worthy Bodhisattva's vow to follow and rejoice in merit and virtue. In actuality, the possible explanations are inexhaustible in number. The Bodhisattva's sixth great vow is to request the turning of the Dharma wheel. 
what is the Dhamma will wills row over things and the Dhamma will rows over gods, demons and those of outside ways. It enables the proper Dhamma to exist eternally. After Shakyamuni became a Buddha, he turned the Dhamma will of the four truths three times and crossed over the five pictures. This is an example of turning the Dhamma will, which basically means to explain the Dhamma. To request the turning of the Dhamma will means to respectfully and sincerely ask the Buddha to speak Dhamma, also ask various Dhamma master to, masters to explain the Buddha's teachings. All of these exemplify universal with his vow, so request the turning of the Dhamma will. For example, we explain sutras here every day and each time the Dhamma simply convene, convenes lay people of or Dhamma masters who request the Dhamma of fulfilling one of the vows and performing one of the practices of the universal worthy Bodhisattva. What value does requesting the turning of the Dhamma will have? We need to have people turning the Dhamma will in this world so that the demon kings will not dare emerge. If no one explains the Dhamma, then the demon kings will come out. The second reason is that when you request the turning of the Dharma will, the merit and virtue created by this wholesome act arises because of you and is obtained by you and you thereby follow and rejoice in merit and virtue. Furthermore, if you request the turning of the Dharma will, you will respond your wisdom that this brings benefit not just to you, because you, your request is that a Dharma master speak the Dharma for everyone, and so it benefits everyone. This is also following and rejoicing in merit and virtue. So you can see that these great vows are all related. When you repent of all karmic obstacles and reform, you also rejoice in merit and virtue. If you wish to follow and rejoice in merit and virtue, you may request the turning of the Dharma will. For this is the greatest way to rejoice in merit and virtue. Turning the Dharma will is not limited to lecturing on sutras and speaking the Dharma. Any activity you do for Buddhism is called turning the Dharma wheel. For example, recording the lectures, translating them, and then printing them in turning the Dharma wheel. Taking notes of the explanations of the sutras is done with the intent of turning the Dharma wheel. First, you take notes, then you memorize them, and then you speak them for others. So now you are preparing to turn the Dharma wheel. Reciting sutras, reading sutras, and bowing to sutras also are all forms of requesting that the Dharma will be turned. Therefore, during uh, turning the Dharma will is not just one special kind of activity. In fact, anything you do which is of benefit to Buddhism is called turning the Dharma will. Writing the instructive verses on the front door participating in the evening lectures and attending the daytime meditation purpose are all considered turning the Dharma wheel. What we do here is to request the turning of the Dharma wheel. If you understand, then in your daily activities, you are requesting the turning of the Dharma wheel. But if you do not understand and just do the work, then all this is just tiresome suffering and only makes you afraid to turn the Dhamma wheel.